Uh, so, my name is Evgeny, and I'm a product manager at TradeGecko. And TG is actually a Singapore-based startup uh, founded by a few Kiwi folks from New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we have over 20 nationalities, 20 cultures at the office. So it's quite an interesting environment. So, as you remember from my pitch, we're going to be talking about product management based on cross-cultural teams. So, product management actually has a diversity problem. And that problem is not just the fact that we don't have good representation from um, LGBTQIA, good representation from women in tech and uh, other ethnicities. It's the, also the fact that once we do get to that cultural diversity and gender diversity, we frequently find ourselves incapable of managing it properly. We all celebrate diverse teams because, well, uh, true, diverse teams allow us to go beyond our traditional practices. But how do we make sure that diverse teams are productive? So, let me show you this. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> it, wor it worked just, oh yeah, there we go, now it works. So, um, this are all people from one of my favorite product, managers, product management podcasts. It's called This is Product Management. Uh, as you can see, there isn't terribly a lot of color there, so to say. <laughs> and the truth is that these product managers come from cities that look like this. And all of their teams come from cities that look like this. And it would have been fine, but right now, no matter how many walls we build or how, we, how much we try to curb immigration. Like, the world is flat, and people will be traveling all over the world. Professionals will be migrating. And as the pitch showed, there are people in the audience who work with teams from cultures other than their own. So, is this, this supposed to work like 30 meters away from the, is this, oh, what? Oops, sorry. Yeah. Is this really product management? Is it really like the truly universal discipline that works for everyone? And the truth is that I really have to stay close to that. <laughs> uh, the truth is that uh, right now in Singapore, we have 190k EP holders. So what does that actually mean? This means that um, people from Singapore, Singaporean managers, will end up working with uh, software engineers from the region. They will end up working with software engineers from Europe, from the US. Because there is a lot of interest in bringing that talent in. We, also, we will also see a bunch of teams local teams working with managers, with product managers from overseas. And the truth is that uh, once we try to bring those practices that we all learn, all of them, from the United States and Canada and maybe Britain, once all of those managers try to bring these practices here, they actually fall remarkably short. If you've ever conducted an agile retrospective with a, with a team where at least one software developer is from mainland China, you will know what I mean. If you try to ask for a feedback, you're not going to get it. Because it's just not how they give feedback. They give feedback in private. So the truth is uh, that we are all ambassadors of our cultures. And a funny thing is that once we try 
to work with teams from other cultures, from other countries. We kind of think that since you had, since I had an international experience and they had an international experience, we kind of on the same level. But that, that couldn't be further away from truth. Because no matter how much we try, we always carry this culture where we were, where we were brought up. We have these cultural traits that we cannot weed out. And in times of crisis, in times of conflict or argument, we expect other people to communicate to us in the same way our compatriots com communicate to us. And that's when um, things get awry, so to say. So, to give you an example, um, so there was a very funny situation at Tregeco when uh, a couple of product managers were arguing about a UI copy. And uh, it was just a work discussion. It was very animated, but it was nothing special. And there was a product designer coming along, like just passing them uh, from a very low conflict Southeast Asian culture. And she thought that they're having a massive work argument to the point that she raised that as a disciplinary question to their manager. And we were like, what? And the manager was from Canada and so was like, what? <laughs> that did not make sense, but that is a real thing. Or another situation when we had uh, a Thai software engineer once once working with uh, a software engineer from the US. And the US guy just left a very direct, straightforward comment uh, on the Thai software engineer's pull request uh, that didn't sit well with him, and he refused to work with him ever again. So, things happen. Things happen when we have the wrong expectations. And it doesn't just happen in Singapore. Uh, there, is, there are sometimes cultural clashes within the same organization, right? So, cultural norm at Google is to give feedback in a very, very positive way, in a kind of, right? But French, the French are very direct, you know? And this manager at Google France found himself in a very unique situation when he had to give feedback in a particularly un-French way, so to say. So it was tough. Let me ask you this question. Is it important for a manager to have at hand precise answers to most questions subordinates raise about the work? Like, literally. What do you think? Yes and no. You think no? Anyone else? I don't think so. Anyone? <laughs> Come again? <laughs> okay, the reality is that uh, in some cultures it isn't. Uh, like in Sweden, for example, yeah, doesn't care. In fact, if a Swedish manager knows something, they will never tell it. Um, an Australian manager tried to apply kind of the same principle to managing their team in China. And it didn't really work out. And the Japanese executive is another interesting example. So we have a manager from the West who's not going to give an answer. And we have a ma an employee from, say, Japan, who's never going to ask a question. It's like, how do you deal with this? So the truth is like implicit communication fails us. It fails us on so many different levels that there is no single way to kind of solve this problem. So like, how do we deal with it? Um, the first question, the, the first problem is you have to solve is you have to calibrate the team. So, and by calibrating the team, I mean that uh, you have to find a way that will work for the team. If you have a cultural majority in the team, let's say a team of uh, Singaporean Chinese developers uh, and a couple of foreigners, 
your default culture is probably Singaporean Chinese and you have to train and you have to coach your foreign developers and yourself, by the way, if you're a foreigner, uh, to default to that mode of communication, the one that works for the majority of your team. If at Trade Gecko, you, if like at Trade Gecko you don't have that, let's say in my team I have uh, a software engineer from mainland China, a software engineer from Ukraine who grew up in Japan, uh, a software engineer from Syria, uh, another engineer from Indonesia, and UX designer from Indonesia, a like bunch of people. There is no cultural majority. Uh, another interesting way to approach this is to find uh, Kind of, kind of map the cultures. Map the cultures and see what works and how does each of them uniquely communicate on multiple dimensions. Uh, there are things like, you know, high context and long context communication. There is the way they give feedback, lead, decide things, and so on and so forth. And you can check this uh, kind of culture map uh, developed by Erin Meyer. She's a professor at INSEAD. It's a very interesting resource. There is a book, The Culture Map, if you want to read on it, or just Google it. Uh, try to understand what is the, you know, what is the preferred way of communication for each of your team members. And then you're going to have to work it out, what works for the rest of the team. All of you have to agree what is the best way? So, however, oh yeah, this is an example of like Israel and Russia. Uh, however, uh, establishing this baseline culture is not always as straightforward. You may end up in a situation when, uh, no matter how much you try, there is also a certain corporate culture that you have to enforce. And I'm consciously using the word enforce. Uh, oops. So basically, uh, do, you know, do you all know L'Oreal, right? It's a French company. So L'Oreal prides itself on very direct communication. So many years back when they first opened the South Korean office, uh, and the flu execs from France flew in and started to have a meeting. Um, their South Korean employees were like horrified because all those French folks, they told them exactly what they thought about their work in a very colorful, vivid language. <laughs> and the South Koreans, like they avoid conflict. And they're like, we can't work here. Um, so that experience taught L'Oreal something very, very important. They decided they will not default to the low conflict, low context, high context mode of communication that the South Koreans were taking. Instead, they developed a course called Managing Confrontation and taught everyone that. But the no name of the course is a little bit misleading. It's called Managing Confrontation, but in the reality, what it teaches the foreign employees to do is to engage in confrontations, embrace them and you know, abandon their home culture and become more French. So they found that those South Korean employees found themselves arguing in a very non-Korean way in a few years after. So another interesting thing that you're going to have to do is you have to abandon leadership colonialism. Uh, Leadership colonialism is this um, peculiar thing, and it's a managerial practice when people from other countries come to the new location, let's say people from the US come to Southeast Asia and say, you know what, you're doing it all wrong. I'm going to tell you and then I'm going to show you how to lead a team, how to build products and how to make business wrong. The fact that you succeeded in your home culture doesn't mean that you're going to succeed in, with your new team in the new, completely new market. The problem with this approach is not just because it's ineffective. 
The problem with this approach is that sometimes these managers and these new leaders they assume that because their teams don't perform as well as uh, they expected, they're either stupid or lazy or just don't communicate well enough. That couldn't be further away from truth again because the manager is also a, prob a part of the problem. So another one is you can't really rely on people's skills and empathy. Um, this one is interesting because we as product managers, we, um, we always try to be empathetic. There is even a saying like among our people in our discipline, like, empathy, go get some. Um, but the truth is empathy is very culturally specific. If you try to be empathetic, to one of your team members, how do you know that the way you express empathy in your home culture is the same as the way they express empathy in, their, empathy in theirs? Um, so empathy is actually a learned ability. We don't become empathetic. We become empathetic in our cultures to our compatriots. So I saw... Um, like, that was a very fun, in, in a way, quote-unquote fun experience. I saw uh, an American manager being genuinely empathetic to uh, his engineers only to be labeled as manipulative by some of them. So the way he was expressing his concerns did not make sense to some of the people on the floor. So don't try to be empathetic because you don't have the training and you have to be trained to be empathetic. And if you don't, like, just abandon it whatsoever. This doesn't mean being a jerk, by the way. This means not relying on your gut feel because your gut feel is probably wrong. So instead, you should try to study your team. Try to understand who they are. So how to approach this? First off, um, what I usually do, I take a step back and just observe the team. How do they communicate with each other? You know, how do they behave? How do they start their day? A software engineer from the US will come at 9, 9.30, make a cup of coffee and dig right into code. A software from engineer, uh, sorry, a software engineer from Indonesia might come by 11:30, make some breakfast, start browsing Facebook, and then drive, dive into code and spend uh, all the day in the office and leave at 11 p.m. Whereas that software engineer from America, like, he's gone by six. They have very different work styles, very different communication styles. Soak it in. You're gonna have to find a unique approach to each of your team members. Just get them out for lunch, you know? Talk to them in the morning. Embrace a small talk, you know? Because that's how you get to know people. That's how you get to know who they are, because um, even the small talk has to be styled differently depending on the culture. Let's say it's very easy to speak about uh, K-pop with someone from Indonesia because it's pretty popular there. Um, but it's probably not going to work out with a software engineer from the US. And uh, another, like one of my favorite tools is instant retrospectives. So after each meeting or after each engagement, I literally ask this question, like, did this work for you? You can ask this in the group. You can ask this in a one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't really matter as long as you get that feedback as soon as you possibly can. And yeah, of course, you're going to have to read and learn. As I mentioned before, um, each of us working in different cultures with people from different cultures have to be trained one way or another. 
And uh, I'm pretty sure that the majority of people in this room don't have an access to uh, actual cross-cultural communication courses that are provided by their company. So you're going to have to learn on your own. So crack a book open. And your fundamental goal is to become a cultural chameleon in a way. Uh, by that I mean that you need to develop a range of communication styles which you can freely choose from, depending on the situation you're in, depending on the team member you're engaging with. And I really want to highlight the word styles because we think of management as, you know, I just do management, I do, do product management, I have my communication style, but it doesn't work if you have people that expect all different things from you. You have to be able to have this range, you know? So, we all know Marty Kagan, right? He's a cool dude. He also uses the same clicker as I do. Um, and he has 35 years of product experience, a massive amount of knowledge. But the reality is that most of that knowledge came from the US. And as much as we want to apply all of it here, whether you're an Asian product manager or whether you're a white product manager like myself, like, you know, we can't rely on all that knowledge. It's just a guidance, it's just a framework. We have to adjust everything, we have to change everything, and we have to experiment. So don't be like Marty Kagan. Be like someone you know, who blends those things together, who takes his frameworks, it takes his ideas and transforms them. Yeah, and um, here are a few references, just very basic. I really like this book, uh, The Culture Map by Erin Meyer. There are a few courses on Coursera. Uh, you can also just Google and look for courses on edX and Udemy. There's plenty of information about cross-cultural communication, managing cross-cultural teams. And I hope that uh, in the future we could all like, get back together again and talk a little bit more about uh, what it means to manage cross-cultural teams. Because it's not easy and I sure as hell don't do it as well as I'd love to. I still make mistakes and I still have communication problems with my team members. Thank you. <laughs> Questions perhaps? This kind sir will help us. Hi, and thank you so much for the engaging talk. Thank and you. be very open to talk about this. I think this topic is super important. So I was wondering if you can share some of your mistakes you made in managing a multicultural like, team, and what what's the takeaway from it? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> so, um, oh, where do I begin? <laughs> there are quite a few. So, I'm I'm originally from Russia. I used to live in Japan for quite some time. Then I moved to Singapore, but I still give um, feedback in a very direct way. And I still uh, talk openly and colorfully, so to say, about a lot of issues that we as a team and as a company face. Uh, some of my engineers uh, are totally cool with that. You know, whatever, we know how Evgeny works and uh, that's the expectation. Some of my engineers, uh, are a little less direct and it's taken them uh, time to adjust to this style and the mistake that I made personally is the fact that I wasn't able at first before I like started working with the team I wasn't able to communicate how I give feedback properly and I wasn't able to 
mm, establish this cultural practice immediately. So it took me a few months to actually figure out where, like, where I set the expectations wrong. So the takeaway from here is uh, don't waste a few months, basically. If you know that, uh, or if you feel that you might miscommunicate in something, that you might be maybe may too direct, but that you might be taking decisions in a way that doesn't sit well with some of your team members, you have to ask them what do they expect. You have to adjust, help them adjust, and you have to adjust your way of communication as well. Um, where, I'm, where I'm going with this is that um, sometimes we think that either they should adjust or I should adjust as manager, but that's also not true. It's on everyone to recognize the fact that we have to find a way that works for both of us. I'm never, and another thing, um, since you have your own cultural expectations, you will never be able to fully overcome them. They are gonna stand, like, stay with you for the rest of your life. Same with my directness and with someone of, like, from China with their indirectness. It's gonna stay with them. They can't change it. Maybe in 30, 40 years working in the US, they will, but it's not gonna happen anytime soon. So you really have to find a way to expose those differences immediately. So I don't do that mistake anymore, right? As much as possible, like, when a new member joins the team, we discuss these things. Did that, did that answer your question? Thank you. Hey, um, okay. why not just set common goals? So it's like having a common enemy, right? So if everybody's going against a Hitler, you don't really need to care about the cultures, per se. Uh, you, you actually, actually do. Uh, how do you know that those goals resonate with your team? How do you know that you communicated them well? How do you know that everybody understands that, let's say, finishing the project in 10 weeks means finishing the project in 10 weeks, not in 15. Because the time is flexible and time is cultural just, just as well. Like, how do you know that the goal is well understood? You don't, unless you actually expose it. Does that answer your question? Uh, I run very specific tasks whereby, you know, when you're running the sprints, everybody knows what they're trying to achieve by the end of the week. So there's a team goal, and then the individual goes from each individual person. So there's not really a need to <coughs> care that much about the culture. We we'll still do the small talks and the lunch and uh, figure out ways to communicate better. But once the goals are set, uh, you run an immediate feedback by your instant retrospectives to make sure everybody's on the same page. They uh, interpreted and, you know, told the whole team what they think they're supposed to do. This is something very interesting right now. You, you use the words, everybody knows. How do you know? Because they, they play it back to you, right? Mm -hmm. So if the tasks are bite-sized enough, then it should be easy for them to, to pick up and, and do it. So over a course of like three to four weeks, I think mm -hmm. the teams will run in and then they should be able to perform. Um. How many nationalities in the team? Oh, based on your experience. And is this a new team? Mine, currently new team. The previous one, maybe six or seven nationalities. Uh, the previous one was an old team, right? The new team, did they, ha have they ever worked together? No. Um, well, look out. I, I thought it's going to work out as well, but uh, it doesn't. Let, um, to give you an example. so. Um, we've all run the retrospect, uh, the, sorry, uh, not the retrospect, the sprint planning sessions, right? With the planning poker. Um, 
Have you ever noticed how sometimes when you estimate a task, um, your some of the people from maybe Asian cultures uh, see the estimate of a white person and comply with it? Have you ever noticed that? So, and they say like, maybe he's right. So the truth is that is one of the source of the problems. Uh, I noticed that at Trey Gecko, that happened before, and it is, it becomes a source of friction eventually over time. So um, you may feel that the team agrees and that, that the team kind of finds an estimate that works for them, but it's also not true because you have a team member who just complied with someone else's opinion because they didn't vocalize their own or were uncomfortable in doing, of doing so or weren't provided an opportunity to do so. So it's true that on the surface you might feel like the team is working well together. They, you know, they found an agreement, uh, but is it really an agreement? Thank you for the slide. I think um, I noticed that as a product manager, this is coming from a perspective of a product manager where you have a very high level of self awareness, where then you notice there's a cultural difference, mm -hmm. but not everybody in the organization or in the culture have the same level of self awareness. I think to make this work, there's a very important component of self awareness. How do we create it or start it to make sure everybody aware of this difference? Sorry. Yeah, uh, that's where the cultural scales actually come very handy. Um, because once you start kind of asking people how how they make decisions, how like how do they approach deadlines, try doing this in a group. Once you start exposing those differences, the conversation starts automatically. Like uh, the other day, I actually asked this question about is it important for the manager to know the answer? I asked the question to some of our execs, who are from the West, by the way, and they, Nick, unanimously said, no, of course not, it's not important. Like, of course, we trust the teams. And then I asked some product designers from the Philippines, and they're like, yeah, of course, this is important. I want the manager to tell you exactly what to do. The smart people. But they expect a very thorough, solid guidance. So, and if you don't ask this question, you will never know the answer. You're gonna have to serve the differences. Because, yes, right, some people are a little bit more in themselves. They are comfortable with working in their functional teams, with the design. They just spend time in Sketch, spend time in Terminal, spend time in like Sublime, whatever. Uh, but they also work with other people, and you need to s start this conversation, kind of force it in a way. It might be uncomfortable at times, but it's for the good. Awesome presentation, Evgeny. Um, so I'll go back to your slide about setting up the baseline culture. Mm -hmm. So my question is, as a product manager who, who works with diverse teams, engineers, sales, marketing, etc. How do you influence this this uh, process of setting up baseline culture? Because as a product manager, you may want to focus on customer product mm -hmm. and and you know revenue, whereas you know different team members would have different focus. So how do you set this baseline culture so that uh, organization goes uh, mm -hmm. in, in the same direction? So in a way, it has to come uh, from both you, from the team, from the teams around you, and from the execs. So it's tricky. Uh, if you don't have the fallback, the organizational fallback, right? If you don't know like what is the culture of, let's say, our company, how do we, as an extended team, solve problems? You're going to have to start from the basic, do it kind of grassroots style, figure out what works for your team because that's your primary concern. Because without your team being happy and productive, there is not going to be any good products, there is not going to be good outcome and output. 
it's like it's all about customer centricity. Everything translates uh, into good products, delightful products. How can employees that don't understand each other build good products? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered that question actually. <laughs> it was a very nebulous answer, but the basic uh, the basic principle is that um, you have to talk a lot. Yeah, I think the practical difficulty is you know, none of them report to you, but you, yeah. know, you still need to be an influencer and, and yeah. you know. to the point. Yeah, every time you use software engineer and my team, I have to recalibrate, I have to reevaluate things. Because there is a new variable in the equation. Thanks. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's really an uh, interesting topic. Um, so I just have a question, a very specific one. On uh, so you have a recommendation basically on adopting uh, different communication styles, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but do you see potentially maybe that's maybe perceived as a problem, right? Because you know if you communicate with a person this way and the other person the other way, uh, would that be kind of perceived as like being you know like not honest and not genuine? Because that you know it's from a it's just a interpretation, but it's subject to culture as well, right? Because um, like so in my experience, I try to be as honest and as genuine as possible, and basically treat everybody sort of. Um, like I'm honest with like all my team members, um, so I don't know whether like having different styles for different people uh, would kind of build this perception, you know, that's like that's not uh, consistent. I guess. I think it's not a question of being honest. It's about, uh, of course, you have to be honest, but does this honesty feel like you're attacking someone? Does this honesty feel like you're taking care of someone? If I'm honest with someone from Russia, I'm sorry, but you're going to be offended. If I try to be honest the same way with you, that's just how it's going to go. So I can't, like, I can be all honest, right? But I have to express it differently. Uh, we have time for one last question. Anymore. Andrews. Uh, you talked a lot about the manager and uh, but a lot of the team depends on the team member relationship with each other. Uh, so does does the whole thesis then mean that the links inside the team, so the team is an intercultural team, yeah, are weaker by default? Oh yeah, very good question. So uh, since I just didn't have a microphone, I actually will repeat it for the audience. So uh, he was asking whether uh, so the talk focus quite a bit on the communication between the, man the product manager or the manager for that matter uh, and the team. But what about the communication within the team? Uh, and does being a cross-cultural team mean that certain links and certain communication patterns are broken between the team members as well? And yes, it absolutely does. So we had a few situations when uh, Software engineers from Syria didn't really communicate well with software engineers from uh, China. Uh, they're both very um, high context cultures. There is a lot of implicit communication going on. Uh, and we had uh, to have multiple retrospectives and discussions about how to make sure that these two people work well together. They're actually very friendly. They've never had a conflict, but they had a plenty of miscommunication. So, uh, yes, being cross-cultural will affect your team not just because, not, by, not only on the manager, uh, software engineer like, level, it will also affect your communication between software engineers, communication between software engineers and designers. Uh, to give you a very clear example, let's say you have um, a software engineer from the US who expects a very egalitarian approach, very flat. And they expect that most of the decisions about the product are done within the team. Now, imagine that you have a product designer, and that's actually a real case. Imagine that you have a product designer 
who is from Southeast Asia and from a culture where uh, they expect a little bit more leadership from their manager, who is the head of design. In that case, you have a software engineer who works with a designer and expects the designer to take the decisions, whereas the designer wants their manager to take the decisions. So there is a handoff process going on that software engineer does not like because it impede, impedes his velocity. So in that case, you actually have to bring everyone into the room and discuss, like, how do we make sure that the product designer is empowered to make decisions and give, gets an implicit buy-in for whatever she does from the head of design and doesn't affect uh, the velocity of the software engineer. So it's not just like a process culture uh, problem, it's a culture problem. Does this answer the question? Um, this yeah. comes to the end of the session. Cool, thank you. Yeah. The next session is at 12.30.